Hey, y'all, this is Johnny D. Just wanted to share some big news with you about the Climb Show Music Business Podcast, which is now a part of American Songwriter Podcast Network. That's right. I am Brent, your co-host, and we are really excited to be part of this network along with some other amazing podcasts. Yeah, so make sure you check it out. It's americansongwriter.com forward slash podcast, or click the link in the episode notes to listen to some more of the best shows in music. That's right. All right, Johnny D., do your thing. Welcome to the climb. This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. That's why we called it the climb. C L I M B. Creating leverage in the music business. You see what we did there? Because that's what you're going to need to get ahead. This is no longer the days where the diamond in the rough with all the talent gets discovered by the right people and they turn them into a superstar. No, you're going to have to get this fire started yourself. And now the labels and the publishing companies are coming in to pour some gasoline on a fire that's already started. That's why we called it The Climb. That's a Baxter name created by my good friend and co-host, Mr. Brent Baxter, who also happens to be an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady A now, Mm -hmm. Joe Nichols, and more. He also helps songwriters like you turn pro by revealing how you can write like a pro, do business like a pro, and then he regularly connects you to the pros. You can find Brent very easily at songwritingpro.com. Once again, that's songwritingpro.com. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. They're breaking artists digitally by identifying new fans through data. It's all very complicated, but thankfully, Johnny is all very smart. And if you're an artist looking to increase your streams, blow up your video views, sell more live show tickets, and get discovered by new fans, TV, and music industry pros, then Daredevil Production can help. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists such as Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andy Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at DaredevilProduction.com. That is production, singular, no S, and there's no S because there is no other. Johnny D. What's up, brother? How you doing, man? Oh, I'm excited today. Going to talk about some songwriting stuff, and I like to geek out on songwriting, so I'm happy about that. We're going to talk about what a song diver is. I have no idea where you're going with this. That's, well, that's... uh, I can't stop thinking about Holy Diver. Holy Diver from Holy Diver. You've been down too long in the midnight sea. Oh, what's becoming of me? I have no sorry. idea what that is. Ronnie but, James Dio, man. Come on. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Arguably one of the best voices in rock and roll. Well, see, <laughs> educate me, Johnny. Educate me. Uh, that's right. We're going to talk about what a song diver is today. Because you know what? Songwriters don't always get songs cut. There are a lot of songwriters out there that don't. But song divers, they have a better chance of getting the cuts. I want to help you become a song diver. So that's what we're going to talk about today. There you go. Well, I'll tell you what, before we do that, let's take care of a little business here. We still know and love our good friends over at Disc Makers. It's more than ever, because of COVID-19 now, a digital world, to be sure. But as these, uh, you know, Broadway's opened up, some of these clubs are starting to open up now, it's going to be a really important role to have physical media in your, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? (laughs) In your arsenal (laughs) for today's independent musician. Digital royalty payments are just so small that you sell one CD, a vinyl t-shirt or a gig, it becomes super, super important to get you from one town to the next. That's right. You know, for every CD you sell at a gig, that equals about 3,000 streams. So one CD can make you as much money as like 3,000 streams. That's a lot of streams and not a lot of CDs. So we believe that you are leaving money on the table when you don't have merch on the table. Thankfully, our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your disc and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even T-shirts. You can find them online at discmakers.com, D-I-S-C, makers.com, or you can give them a call at 800-468-9353. That's 800-468-9353. There you go. And if you haven't joined the Climb community on Facebook already, please do so. This is a thriving Facebook group with songwriters, singers, independent musicians, independent artists. Everybody's there. It's very, very active. It's not your normal Facebook group, to be sure. 
We post lots of information in there and ask questions. People getting hooked up with other rights. They're they're having marketing issues. They talk about it. They get answers. And just a really, really cool group. Brent and I are very proud of this. You have to ask to be let in. We let everybody in, so don't worry. But you got to ask to be let in. you got to be good boys and girls. There's plenty of places for you to put your video and your songs. you just got to put them in the right places or you get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we don't want that to happen. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you consume podcasts. Leave a rating and review. We're trying to get to 200 right now. And it takes you 30 seconds. Hopefully, it's a five-star. We hope we like so. those. Mm-hmm. But we read them all on the air. So if it's a one star, we've had those before, a two star, we'll read that too and take it on the chin because we're, we're all about the real over here. <laughs> yes. Finally, the best thing you can do, if, if some of this information in these episodes is getting to you and making sense to you and making a change, share it with another artist, another songwriter, another musician, somebody in your band. Just, hey, you got to listen to this. This is good stuff. It's, you know, it's making me think differently about some things. So that, that's what we hope. That's what we want. Mm-hmm. So that said, my friend, what in the wide, wide world of sports <laughs> is a song diver? <laughs> that's right. Well, before we get to that, I just want to wish my wife, Emily, who is not listening to this podcast nor has ever listened to this podcast, a happy 14th anniversary. I love you, sweetheart. And I'm sorry for whatever I did this morning that probably let you down. So <laughs> with that out the She's way. She's got you trained good. <laughs> yeah, I just I know it's we're recording this a couple of weeks out and I just already know that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> And I will, it will probably happen again next year, and I'm sorry. So, all right, so let's talk about what a song diver is. See, I hate to tell you this, but you, dear climber, are probably never going to write a hit. Wah, wah, wah. But there's good news. The characters in your song might just write those hits. So this was, I don't know, like a year and a half ago now, it feels like, but I spent a weekend up at Martha's Vineyard at the Songwriters Festival up there teaching songwriting and a workshop up there with multi-hit songwriter Jimmy Yeary. He has the new Tim McGraw single right now out called uh, I Called Mama, and he's had a bunch of other hits. But uh, Mm. just some of the stuff that he really was laying into heavy sure made an impression on me, and I just wanted to share it because it's too good not to share. So Nice. And that's one thing I love about like teaching songwriting is that it's a great way for me to continue learning the art, craft, and business of songwriting. Like you prepare for a workshop or a blog or a podcast, it forces you to kind of thoughtfully consider a topic. If you've done this for a while, you have to think about a lot of different topics and stuff. So another way I learned is from people around me like Jimmy. You know, So we got to teach this thing together. He's also a great teacher. But one thing over that weekend that he kept hammering you know, were some songwriting truths that I know and that I've used, but sometimes don't teach enough. And sometimes I don't even use them in my own songs. So it's funny. They say you learn by teaching, and that's that's true for me. So you want to be a song diver, and that's not a phrase that Jimmy used, but it's just kind of my way of describing what he was talking about. You want to dive deeply into your song is basically what that comes down to. You're not just writing it. Sometimes songs feel written. They feel like it's something you're making up or that you're just being clever or whatever. What I want you to do is to dive into your song, not just to write your song, but to dive into it. It's not enough just to, as Jimmy said, that we can throw lyrics at an idea. Oh, I had an idea. Let's throw some lyrics at it and see what sticks. It's not enough to stand at a distance to consider a song idea and then to start trying to rhyme it into a story. I don't think that's enough for those great songs, especially those songs that cut through, the songs that are the outside cuts, the songs that are like the song of the year, the songs that it's going to take for you to move from songwriting obscurity to getting a toehold in the business and to maybe getting some cuts and some hits. You know, it's a different game. We've talked about that a lot lately. It's a different game that you have to play as a climbing songwriter than it is for someone who's already in the business, writing with the artist, or is the artist, that sort of thing. It could be a little bit of a different game. So if you're going to bypass that stuff, sometimes we can just try to write what we hear on the radio, and the radio is not really the bar because that's written by people that have the deal. you got to be a little bit better if you want to get the deal. And I think you do that by diving deeply into your song, like diving into the idea, diving into the story. You know, is it a story about heartbreak? Then go back into your memory and relive a heartbreaking experience you've had. Like, where does that put you emotionally? Try to go back to that kind of that that place. Is it a song about your first kiss? Then don't just write about somebody's made up first kiss, right? Take some time to go back to your first kiss in your mind. See it again. Feel it again. Feel the emotions. And then you can paint the picture. And even if those pictures aren't exactly what you put into your story— 
you know, maybe your song is in a different situation, but you're like, there's a first kiss that happens in this. Well, I don't want to paint the the story of the hallway in the school, whatever, where I got my first kiss, you know, right before third period or whatever, you know, that's not appropriate for this song. But you still go there and relive those emotions. Yeah. And that's going to inform, even if you use different specifics, it's going to inform them emotionally. You know, you want to anchor yourself. This is how the actors do it. This is how you're taught to deliver that believable performance on stage or on screen is you go back to some really painful memory Mm -hmm. and you just draw from that, right? Like you go back there and you got to feel it again. You got to hurt again or you got to love again or be excited about that first kiss again. And then if you're reliving that in your brain and you're intentional, I mean, that's an intentional thing, right? I think that's where some of the songwriters are kind of lazy, right? The difference between an amateur Mm -hmm. songwriter and like a pro, or at least pro quality versus amateur quality. Let's just say that maybe they're not actually pros yet, but they got great songs. Right, yeah. But I think it's that there are intentional moves that you have to make to be able to effectively convey or describe or illustrate what you're feeling. You have to go there. That's the part of being vulnerable, right? You got to go back and revisit that thing. And sometimes it can be really good. Sometimes it can be really painful, Mm -hmm. but you need to transport back there and then look around the room in the moment, the past moment. And what did you see? What did you smell? What was she wearing? What her earrings look like? Like just take a sort of inventory, right? Mm -hmm. To dive back in there. And that's how they teach actors to really just all of a sudden get triggered to emote, Essentially. You got to do the emotional work. It's funny you say that. I remember, and you know, I'm not an actor by any means, but I play one on TV. But I was, I don't know, I was like high school or might have been my freshman year in college. I went back for my church's youth choir tour. 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 I don't know how to say tour. If Mindy, if you're listening, I still don't tour. know how to say it. Tour. T O U R. <laughs> and um, I can't say digital either. Digitally. If you listen to my intro, but I take a deep breath. Anyway, yeah, I was definitely like a freshman in college. I was up like all night the night before. I was up in Jonesboro doing fraternity stuff, getting ready for whatever. And then we're going to on this week, you know, choir tour for our church, youth group. I don't sing and I don't dance or do choreography because we're Baptist. We don't do dancing. So I was one of the actors okay. on that year. And I played this part of this bully. I was up late. And, you know, it was an early call to get us on the bus and get on the road and get to our first stop and do our run through. And we hadn't really done a lot of run-throughs, and I was tired, I was stressed, and just not in a great place. And right before, there was something that happened that just got my adrenaline jacked. Some guys were play fighting. I thought they were really fighting. Anyway, it got me to the spot where, like, when we did that part of where I punch a dude, and I get really mad at him because he wouldn't do my homework, whatever. And I was just a bully in this play. I got really ticked off. Like, I wasn't really ticked off, but... It's funny because I was stressed out enough, whatever, I was able to tap into that and like scared them (laughs) because I was bigger than everybody anyway. And they're like, dude, chill. And I was able to tap into that for the rest of the week. But it was finding that emotional kind of hook that I was able to tap into for the rest of the week for the rest of those shows made it so much better. And for songwriting, yeah, you want to find that emotional connection point for you instead of being all up in your head. Yeah. Uh, which is a big thing, you know, and it can be tempting to write at the surface, to stop at the surface. It can be scary to be vulnerable in your song, like you talked about, Johnny, or to be vulnerable in the room with your co-writers. And it can be vulnerable to tell the honest truth to your listeners, to your co-writers, and even to yourself. But you don't want to stop at the surface. Your best writing is waiting for you down deep. And that's where you need to go. You need to go down deep. So basically, you you want to become the character in your song, not like 24-7, right? I'm not talking about outside the room, like those kind of actors that are, uh, oh, what are they called? The method actors. The method Method actor, actor. that kind of thing where, you know, like Jared Leto will be a complete freak for the three months or whatever they're filming Suicide Squad when he's playing the Joker and he'll send dead rats to his co-stars and the mail and that kind of weirdness, you know. You know, you don't have to maybe do all that. But while you're in the room, take that time to really dive in. And, you know, if your song is memory or a partial memory of something, like really try to go back to that time and that place in your mind, in your heart. Slow down. Okay. It's not a race. Mm -hmm. Feel those emotions again. 
and give yourself something to tap into. So you're not just going, oh, here's a clever idea. Let's just throw some lyrics at it. And then it doesn't really resonate with anybody because you're just being clever, you know? But what if the song isn't a true experience? What if you haven't lived the story in your song? So I think even more so than you have to become the character in your song. You have to imagine what it would feel like really feel like to be the person in that situation. For me, I didn't live the story of a song I wrote that went top five for Alan Jackson, Monday Morning Church. I didn't live that. It's about someone whose wife died and he's having a crisis of faith. I was single and in college. I didn't probably even have a girlfriend then because you can pretty much throw a dart on my timeline and my history and odds are I didn't have a girlfriend then. So I probably didn't have a girlfriend (laughs) then. But <laughs> really good at being single. Anyway, <laughs> so I didn't live that story, obviously, but I kind of did live it for a little bit. I imagined as best I could. That song came title first, and I started going, what does this title say to me? And I thought of the idea of someone whose wife had died, and he's having a crisis of faith, right? So I imagined what would that look like to be married to someone who's stronger in the faith than you are, and then they pass away, and you're angry at God. What emotions would you be feeling? What does it look like? What does the house look like? And I imagined all these different things. Probably keeps her Bible on the dresser, you know, or the nightstand, really, nightstand, right by the bed, because she'd read her Bible in the morning or at night or whatever. And I'm lying here by myself, and her side of the bed is empty, but that Bible's still there. And mm. I'm just, I'm mad. And I can't talk to God. I just can't deal with it. I can't talk to God without yelling right now. And so I open up the drawer and I put the Bible in there and shut it because I can't deal right now. And that was all imagination and conjecture and going, what would it be like? You know, I imagine myself in that bed by myself. And there's souvenirs of her life still there. And how does that relate to you know, what I'm going through and going, there's a piano where she used to sit and kind of play hymns and stuff. The keys are collecting dust, but I can't close the lid because that's like closing a chapter or closing a casket lid. Because that's saying she's not coming back. I can close the lid and cover up the keys. I mean, I can't do that. And so all that is just imagination, conjecture, taking what I know of loss and loneliness that we've all experienced to some extent and applying it to this situation. You know? Oh. Yeah. I got a question. Sure. This may be out there. Okay. Okay. But I'm just wondering, okay, so when adults go to therapy okay. and they're having problems being transparent with their spouse mm-hmm. and they can't be that vulnerable for whatever reason, mm-hmm. one of the things that they do is like this third person thing, right? Where you, maybe they use a puppet mm-hmm. and the puppet gets to talk and it becomes easier to do that. This sort of disengagement of the direct one-to-one where you have like emotional, plausible deniability mm-hmm. allows people to go a lot deeper. Gives like, you a little bit of escape hatch kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Like a vulnerability escape hatch because it's not you saying it, it's the puppet saying it, yeah. right? For instance, this is how they caught Ted Bundy. Because mm-hmm. they couldn't, Ted Bundy was really, really, really smart. They couldn't get him to cop to anything. So then they just went to him and started asking him like, hey, we got this murder situation. We just wanted to ask you about it because... What would you have done in a situation like this? Is this guy smart or not smart? And so he was able to describe how brilliant he was in the third person. Mm-hmm. And then that's how they got all the details to be able to, you know what I mean? It just yeah. unlocks this thing that allows you to kind of go deeper. And so here's the weird part of so this. So be like Ted is what you're sense. saying. Be like Ted. That's great, Johnny. Thank you. Yeah. Well, is there a third, no. is there an exercise? Is there a mental, emotional exercise or place that you can go where you can be like a third person thing that will allow you to kind of dig down. Mm-hmm. You remember the riveting performance that, gosh, what was the actor's name? He died after um, Bat- the Batman uh, movie. Heath but he was Ledger. Like the- Heath Ledger and the Heath Joker Ledger, in the Dark yeah, Knight. He yeah. plays the Joker, right? So, so uh, on top of the method acting thing, another trick that actors use, now this maybe is more visual than thought-provoking, and Heath Ledger applied this to the Joker, but they are like, take on the characteristics of an animal. Hmm. And Keith Ledger, if, if you go back and watch that Joker performance now, his animal was a lizard. Hmm. And so the, lick, the licking of the lips... Yeah, just, that's what I pictured, that he would yeah. Do, all of a sudden, it added this creepy factor to him, right? Because... It just made him more menacing and allowed him to go there. So I'm just wondering if there's anything in that that whole dump truck of furniture wow. I just unloaded in front of your yard <laughs> that can be used to help facilitate that 
vulnerability, like to go there and really connect. To your point that you just brought up, Brent, like the way that you did not live Monday morning church, Mm -hmm. well, these actors have, they're portraying characters. This is not their story. Right. And a lot of times they're fictional characters, so it's Mm -hmm. not even like real. They just got to make it up. So I wonder if there's a way to go and get that pain that way. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, maybe some ways or solo writing, it can be harder if you're in the room with somebody to kind of drop that guard, you know, if you don't know them well and there's not that level of trust yet. So maybe it, it's solo writing, it's journaling, it's like writing memoirs. You know, I have different books that are like writing prompts for like memoirs and that kind of stuff. And I do it partly just because it's fun and I'm a writer. I like to write. <laughs> like I look down, it doesn't matter if it's a paragraph of like memories, my earliest memories of water that I don't anticipate turning into a song. I'm just like, oh, that was fun, you know? And so for me, it's kind of fun to dive into memory and, and that kind of stuff. And so that may be a way to practice, hopefully kind of ruthless honesty. Mm-hmm. And some songs you may have to write third person. I mean, we've talked on recent podcasts about this thing. I wrote with a couple of guys about this guy that's going to be a first time father. And we decided to write it. And it was a, a very intentional conversation about, do we write this first person or third person? And we intentionally decided to write it third person, where he's sitting in the kitchen, having a drink, thinking about, wow, I'm about to be a dad, versus I'm sitting in the kitchen having a drink because, wow, I'm about to be a dad. While we weren't scared to go there first person as writers to say it, because we all felt safe just being open and honest about what our feelings were, first time we found out we are going to be dads, all this stuff— we thought, well, maybe the artist who has to embody this might be a little worried about that, you know, how that's going to come off. So we'll make it third person. Yeah. And so yeah. that way the artist just gets to say, hey, here's this dude doing this thing. I'm not saying I'm that dude. I'm doing that thing. If, if it rubs you a little bit wrong, I'm just telling you a compelling story that a lot of you are going to be able to relate to. But in case you don't, there's a little distance. So it gives the artist like plausible deniability. Exactly. Right? Like they like, can just sing about it or if they want to connect themselves to it in the live show – they can say something before they're playing the song. Yeah, it's like, dude, I've been here, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we didn't need that as writers to do that, but that's maybe a way that you can can give yourself a little distance to say some things that maybe you don't want in quotes next to your face, but you can have somebody else say it. Or that may just be enough for to get it on the page, and then you can change the pronouns and make it, you know, yourself saying it. You know, it may help you be brave to take that little extra step. So I think journaling, solo writing, spending time with your own thoughts, and the big thing is slowing down, slowing down, so you're not just trying to write the rhymes. I drive your truck, and it's a song we've talked about so much. But Jimmy was a writer on that. So when he says dive into your song, I'm gonna listen to him because that was like CMA and ACM song of the year that he helped write with Connie Harrington and Jesse mm-hmm. Alexander. So I drive your truck. It was someone else's story. But they, in their minds, became the guy who lost his brother in Afghanistan and drove his truck as a way of coping with a loss. You know, so they pictured the 89 cents in the ashtray. They pictured themselves tearing up that field. They brought themselves to real emotion and real tears, I bet, you know, just even though they hadn't lived it. They're like, what would this be like? You know, it came from an interview on NPR where— they were interviewing a dad up north somewhere who lost his son. Like, how do you deal with it? Well, you know, we drive his truck. You know, I drive his truck. And that's where it all started. And so, Oh, really? Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Oh, dude. Okay, so there's a documentary out. It's on, I know it's on Amazon. That's where I watched it. But it's called It All Begins With a Song. And so it's a lot with like... Wait, what's it called? It All Begins With a Song. Okay. And they interview all these hit writers. And they talk to Jesse Alexander and Connie Harrington. They get the story. And so I Drive Your Truck is a big part of it. They actually go up and meet the dad. And they see the truck. And they they go for a ride in the truck that inspired this. And they play him the song for the first time. Because he never had heard it just because he was like, "Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I want to uncork that one kind of thing. But he'd heard about it. So they found the guy. Jesse played it for him. And Connie's just bawling in the corner, you know, as she balls a lot. Oh. Uh, but yeah, anyway, really cool. So it all begins with a song. If you can find that documentary, it's it's really cool. It gets you fired up. Oh, I want to see that. Yeah, it's yeah. good. It's good. Being clever is fun, but it's not enough. You know, you got to bring the heart and not just the head. So playing with words isn't going to get you where you want to go. You got to really feel it. And speaking of Connie Harrington, I, I saw her. At, I was teaching at an NSAI, you know, summer 
camp kind of thing, song camp or advanced camp or something a couple of years ago. And, and she was one of the speakers and she was talking about how to drive your truck and different stuff. I think this was from her, but she said, you know, wordplay still has to be true. Like you can't just be clever. It's still got to be true. And as writers, sometimes we get these clever little word plays and, and tools in our toolbox. But you got to remember that the tool doesn't serve itself. The hammer doesn't serve itself. The saw doesn't serve itself. The saw and the hammer, they serve the project that you're on. And the project that you're on is telling the truth, is having some sort of emotional truth and resonance. And so the hammer doesn't bang around just to make noise, which is what your wordplay can be if you're just being like clever for the sake of being clever. Like, does it serve the wall you're trying to put up, the house you're trying to build? It serves that. It doesn't just serve itself. So I want to challenge you to dive deeply into your next song. So not just to float on the surface, but to dive, be a song diver, to feel it, to become that character, to write what you see, to write what you feel, to be honest. Because that emotion is what's going to make your song much more real, much more powerful. As I'm starting to tell people more and more these days, honesty is your superpower. Use it. Yeah. It's your superpower. That honesty because that's what can cut through. Because they're writers all day long that can out clever each other and probably out clever you. So what? It's that that emotional resonance that comes from being willing to be a diver and to go and do the emotional work and slow down and not just go oh oh uh, make love all night rhymes with Eugene so tight here we go you know and go <laughs> okay okay this situation what's real not just what's wordplay what's real. Because you're going to find those little nuggets along the way that people will be like, okay, that's that feels real. That doesn't feel like it's just written, you know. Yeah, and you get I mean, some songs I mean, cl- that just feel for like, the sake of- okay, you're telling me the story. I don't really believe you because it doesn't have that little detail or that emotional undercurrent or that something. It just feels like you're making up a story. Other songs, I had people come up with me after Alan released Monday Morning Church, and we're like, man, did you lose somebody? I'm like, nope. And it's it's an awkward situation. We're like, no, you know, just something I wrote. But that's where you want to be. Like, you connect with it that much that people are going to buy it, literally and figuratively, really. There's a, an emotional weight and authenticity to it. And not that it has to be like a, I'm swinging for, you know, the saddest song of the year or the, all this trauma. It didn't have to be that. It could be the fun stuff, the funny stuff. But just being more real, I mean, our Randy Travis thing, Every Head Bowed, is a silly song. So it's like on the opposite end of the spectrum from Monday Morning Church. But, man, I went back in my mind, and, and Brandon Kenny and I, when we wrote that, just were thinking about growing up in church and in my corduroy coat and, you know, sneaking Twinkies and watching the Lord's Supper go by and just all these little things. We went and we became the characters just in our minds, and we were able to paint this thing that people really resonated with, you know? And so that's what I want to challenge you guys to do. I see this too much. Like a rhyme for the sake of a rhyme. Yeah. Or clever for the sake of being clever. Mm-hmm. It's really transparently like shallow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like, oh. And you just know right away that there's nothing in there. So if that's the goal, then nobody's going to respond the way that you want them to. Because they're going to see there's really kind of a lack of thought in it. It doesn't really take a whole lot. But if you apply that same energy to going deep and and song diving as Mm -hmm. opposed to just how clever can we be? Right. How honest can we be? Yeah. If you go that way and spend that energy there, you're going to have a monumentally better lyric. Yeah. You know, a singer singing a song that they don't really get versus a singer singing a song that they get. Yeah. And they can barely get through. Right. There's just something more. Like the other singer may hit the notes. If they're technically good, but sometimes a singer can just own it and sell it. And you're like, oh, I, I buy that off this person, not off the other person. Maybe it's it's yeah. finding that connection like an actor, finding that, what's my motivation? You know, finding that plug in. And that's what we got to do as writers. You got to dive in, not just skim over the surface. You don't want it to feel written. You want it to feel like I'm just over here in somebody's confessional. Yeah. And it just happens to rhyme. And it may be interesting the way they say it, but ultimately, like, I believe it. And you can't even believe it if you don't dive in. Not really. You know, I think that's your superpower is honesty or finding that emotional connection where it matters to you. Yeah. How about that? Hold on. You touched on something there. Like for the frustrated writers out there, you know, for the ones who are like, well, nobody gets it. Nobody. I mean, how do you expect anybody 
How can you honestly expect anybody to derive some sort of deep emotional moving reaction to some lyrics that didn't actually emotionally move you when you wrote them? You were just trying to be clever. Yeah, I've heard. Or you're just trying to rhyme. I've heard it said before, you know, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Yeah. You know, about novels and stuff. You got to feel it, you know? Yeah. It's not enough to just feel it because that's where craft comes in to actually convey the emotion and put that into the song where it's transmissible (laughs) to the listener. Because sometimes you may feel something very deeply and you just don't craft it well enough for that. It gets lost in translation. So it's not enough just to feel it because, you know, you can kind of fail on the other side of it too. It's like, I feel it so much, but you don't connect the dots for the listener. Like it's all there when you see it. You know, you can cry looking at a wedding picture, but don't expect me to cry when I look at it if I don't have the context. You know, you got to build that into your song. So it's not enough to just have emotion. That's where craft comes in too. Yeah. To connect those dots, to make it where it's contagious, basically, where the listener can catch that emotion that you mean. So... It takes both the heart and the craft of songwriting. Yeah, you know, the difference is like on a visual level, like imagine if professional construction people approached building the same way that most writers approach songwriting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? No it's like, well, here's a hammer, here's a nail. I'm going to nail this to this. I'm going to put some stuff on it. It looks like some fifth graders put together a doghouse, you know what I mean? It's a mess, right? You know, but there is like a a discernible roof and there's a discernible door, although it's not the same length on one side as it is on the other. And there's some weird window, but none of it looks good. And then somebody who knows how to craft Mm -hmm. a doghouse and it just looks beautiful. And there's the difference. It's like, you've got to know what you're doing, take your time, measure twice, cut once, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's the craft stuff for sure. But a way I look at this maybe emotionally using that kind of analogy would be you build this three-story house that looks amazing, but you didn't pour a good foundation. It's going to crack and it's going to fall over. Or it's a facade like in Hollywood. It looks good from the front, but as soon as you walk through the door, you know it's a fagazi. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's that emotional work. That's the foundation that this thing can rest on because then you know you have some rock solid and real that you can build on. Then you build this house on that foundation. If you don't dive in, if you don't do the work, there's not that foundation. And it may be interesting, like, oh, that's a cool looking house until it falls over in the first storm. Oh, it's not such a good looking house. It couldn't stand up. It's not going to pass inspection. Couldn't stand up. That just happened. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) All right. That's what I had to talk about today. Hey, listen, I love helping songwriters. and And I do that, you know, all the time through my songwriting site, songwritingpro.com. I would love to help you all out. You know, if you're new to the climb, if you're new to the podcast, maybe you came with the American Songwriter Podcast Network, you came in through another avenue, but we're just glad you're here. I would love to give you a gift, kind of welcome you to the crew. It's at songwritingpro.com, and you just click on the little thing. It says free gift up at the top, and it gives you my ebook, Think Like a Pro Songwriter. You just tell me where to send it. I send it to you. And just covers some of the lessons I've learned uh, making mistakes and having some successes in the music business over the past several years. And it's my gift to you. Just tell me where to send it. It'll be on the way. And also, we have a lot of other fun stuff going on there that uh, is worth you know a little bit of scrutiny. See, we have some opportunities coming up for you. But that's at songwritingpro.com. There you go, guys. Join the Climb community. Subscribe to the podcast. Make sure that uh, you tell a friend about it. And leave a rating and review. That's going to help us out. Once again, we're super stoked to be on the American Songwriter Podcast Network. And there's a bunch of other great shows on there that you want to check out. And you're going to find a lot of love over there. This podcast exists because we want you to win. So keep on climbing. And we'll see you at the top. 